Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to talk to you today about how Satan can destroy a Christian. Um, you know, we're going to be getting back to the Revelation studies eventually here. We've got a lot of stuff going on right now, and they take a lot of research and a lot of study, a lot of prayer. Um, but uh, I see things, and, and I see Christians going in certain ways, and I get a lot of contact with people. And, and uh, it, Lord really put this on my heart to preach this because I don't have anything like this on my channel here. So I need to, need to do this sermon to warn you out there uh, how Satan will come after you. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 5 says here, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together with my spirit, or excuse me, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In context, it's talking about a man that was fornicating with his father's wife. You read that in verse 1 there. Um, doesn't mean necessarily that it was his birth mother. It could have been a stepmother. But either way, it's very, very wicked. And they were basically putting up with it. And so one of the ways is there through sex perversion. And you can get involved in sex perversion as a Bible-believing Christian. Um, you start getting away from the Bible. You start getting away from praying. You start getting away from witnessing and, you know, start messing around on the Internet, looking at things that you shouldn't look at or television or whatever else. Um, you can get messed up. But notice what happens there. Verse 5, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Satan can get control of your flesh and give you sickness and disease and all kinds of stuff. And ironically, if you're going out and fornicating and things, you get into the you know prostitution and stuff like that, you can get a lot of different sexually transmitted diseases that will destroy your flesh. Kind of interesting. But verse 5 says, goes on to say that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So you see, the devil can get permission to mess up your flesh, but he can't touch your spirit. If you're redeemed, you're going to go to heaven you know, when you die. Uh, that's just the way it is. You are sealed until the day of redemption. Next, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 24 through 27 it says here, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means... When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, there's a statement, there's a number of statements you're going to learn as a Christian. And when, when you learn things as a Christian, you'll learn them. You say, huh, what does it? When you hear something, you're later going to see it come into practice in your life. I'm sure you've already seen that if you've been saved for any length of time. You will hear something and you'll go, that's really, that's kind of profound. And later on, you're going to be like, that's exactly what I'm going through. <laughs> you know, that'll happen. Okay. What am I talking about? Um, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I'll get back to it. But notice he says here, um, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I don't want to just, okay, I got it back in my head. Um, here's the statement. Okay. You cannot waste your time serving the Lord. What are we talking about? Not as uncertainly. When you're running the race, you can't say, you know, I wonder if I'm going to get, you know, you're, you're running some marathon and stuff. You run along and you go, you know, I wonder if I'm going to get disqualified. What if there's some kind of a weird thing here? What if it's, there's some politics involved and, and, you know, somebody goes past me or whatever. Christian, when you are running the race that's set before you, when you're witnessing to people, when you're reading your Bible, when you're living for the Lord, there is no uncertainty about it. You know, you're not going to get up there and, and get to the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord's going to go, all right, it's time to judge you. Um, oh, where did I put the paper? Um, hey, uh, Michael, you know, the archangel, uh, uh, where, could you bring up the file on, um, what was your name again? The Lord knows, okay? 
you are not in an uncertain race here. Everything that you do serving the Lord is recorded by the Lord and you'll be rewarded one day. You cannot waste your time serving the Lord. I'll say it one more time. Christian, you cannot waste your time serving your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, what kind of promises do we have on earth like that? Do you ever get to the end of a day and you just get there and you're just like, I wasted my whole day. <laughs> you know, I just, I accomplished like nothing today. I mean, I had a whole bunch of stuff I needed to get done. I didn't get any of it done. You're just like going, oh Lord, I wasted a whole day of my life. I went to get online. I was going to research such and such, or I had to look this up and I had to answer this person's email. I never did answer their email and I had this and that and whatever else. There's a lot of uncertain things in this life, but serving Jesus Christ is not uncertain. <clears throat> so fight I, verse 26, not as one that beateth the air. When you're fighting against the devil, it's a real battle. You're not just sitting there going like this, you know, doing your hands and stuff and there's nobody there and whatever. Uh-uh. When you get into spiritual warfare issues, you're fighting real battle there. But notice verse 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That is a challenge. Okay? I will speak from experience. Um, there are times that your body says, Okay, be lazy. You've studied the Bible enough. Just, just kind of go and you know, watch some entertainment videos or, or just kind of take some time off. You know, Yes, okay, you shouldn't eat that unhealthy junk food, but it, you earned it. You know, and you go, oh, not me, brother. I fight that stuff. I'm good at fighting these things. I, I stick with the Bible. I, I, I don't waste time on anything else. Do you take a break? <laughs> Here's where the challenge comes in. Because you can, you know, we're to do all things in moderation. So don't get lazy and eat junk food and stuff like that. Ruin your health. Wreck your health. See, like it's talking about there. But don't go the opposite direction. Work too hard. Again, I speak from experience. Uh, there has been many, many times when I have lost sleep. Um, many times when I've just, you know, literally almost ruined the sanity of my, my family. Because it's just, i got to get these videos done. i gotta get, I got to get this stuff done. i got this research to do and whatever else. I mean, we're talking about going on vacation before long. Um, that'll be the first time since we've been here in the state of Maine. Um, you know, going on, well, it's over three years, going on four years. I mean, my wife and I, we got married. We're going to be coming up to our fifth year anniversary soon. And we went on our honeymoon. And the other vacation was nothing. <laughs> um, you say, oh boy, you're real servant of the Lord. Well, you know what, brethren? Sometimes it's a little dumb to push that hard. Because you start to burn out. And by God's grace, you know, he's helped us to stay in the fight and things. But uh, there's times as a Christian, you got to do both things. Don't get lazy, don't go to the junk food, but don't get so, you know, worked up about exercise and worked up about serving the Lord and everything else that you aren't smart enough to take some time off. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ took time off. He didn't need to go fishing with his disciples. Hey, get, you know, let's get out in the boat, cast off from land, and he's like preaching to the people, okay, see you, you know, let's go out here. And he goes down in the hold and he's down there sleeping. Well, what a waste of time. He could be out winning souls, inviting people to church, you know, knocking on doors. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay, that's a challenge. And see, the devil can blindside you with this thing because you can get convicted about the junk food and you can get convicted about the extra or the uh, entertainment. But sometimes he can get you so involved in ministry and doing things for the Lord that you begin to fit, forsake rest. And relaxation. See what I'm saying? Go next to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Okay, here's another way that the devil can get you. 
uh, verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. I've talked about this text many times. But what's going on here? Occasionally, you are supposed to do a little self-examination test. And you're supposed to remember how Jesus died on the cross and doing these things in remembrance. It's not Eucharistic salvation or something like the Catholics teach. You don't have to go to some priest and do his little... Uh, transubstantiation, Latin hocus-pocus stuff to transform a cookie and wine into flesh and blood that you can somehow eat and drink, even though the Bible says not to drink the blood. You know, figure that one out. But what's going on here? Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And now here's the thing. You say, well, let's see, that's lost people. Lost people come in. They're not discerning the Lord's body. They're not understanding what Jesus did on the cross. It's not there for their salvation. But look at this. Verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, saved people, and many sleep. As a Christian, you can start to uh, get kind of worldly and start forgetting the great price that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. And what does that lead to? You mess around in sin. I mean, all these movements of this, uh, the new gospels that have come out, you know, in recent years of the easy believism where there's no repentance, um, you know, the, the thing of uh, no prayer, you don't have to pray, you just, just imagine in your mind that you've been saved and and there you go. I'm saved. I took it, you know, from God, and and uh, I didn't have to ask for it. I mean, you know, real good manners there, you know. Just uh, salvation is there, and you just come to go. God says, "What are you doing? I don't have to ask for it. I just take it. Take that salvation for myself." Okay, <laughs> you know, what's all this stuff about? All these movements, these false gospels, it's all about one thing. They're trying to get away from that conviction of sin. The easy believism heretic says there, has, there doesn't have to be any repentance. You just say, we have all sinned, and sin is just a general thing. We, okay, all have sinned. All right, yeah, sure, okay, I've done something wrong, but I don't need to feel convicted over it. I don't need to feel like I need to change my life, you know, after salvation. Uh, just, you know, okay, we're all sinners, you know. See? They take a later attitude towards sin. The people that don't want to pray... They don't want to come before God and say, fall down on their knees and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh, well, sinner? Oh, wow. You know, see, we're back to that again. So what happens is you have people and they say, and these in the text here, they're genuinely saved people. And as a Christian, you can get to that point where you are genuinely saved, but you are actually starting to forget how great a price God paid you know, to pay for those sins of yours. And what can happen is you can actually get to a point where you start to fall back into those sins because you start to listen to false prophets that take a lighter attitude towards sin, you know, and they kind of, you know, joke about things and stuff and, and uh, they laugh about, I was watching this thing on television last night and whatever, and you go, you know, I gave up television in the past, but, well, Pastor so-and-so, you know, he, he watched it. Like, maybe it's okay. Well, I gave this up and I gave that up, you know, Years ago, the Lord convicted me of that, but hey, they're doing it, so maybe it would be okay for me to do it. And pretty soon, you have just a flippant attitude towards the fact that Jesus had to die on the cross because of sinners. You know, communion is supposed to be a very solemn time. And, you know, I don't think you have to do it every week or anything, but, you know, we try to do it at least once a year. You know, and um, it's a time of self-examination. It's a time of reflection where you think about, wow, Jesus, he died for those sins of mine. And, oh, boy, and what does it lead to? Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
Now, how can you uh, judge yourself if you don't, don't have a changed life? I mean, you get saved and the Lord starts to clean up your life, the process of sanctification. How does it come in there that you're judging yourself? See, when you judge yourself, it's because you're changing things in your life. And you look and you go, oh, you know, I, I still haven't given up on uh, whatever sin. <sighs> you know, I got to get that thing. And you think about Jesus dying on the cross and the, and, and the screams and the blood and the, just the, the pain that our Savior went through. And you go, I'm sorry, Lord. You see what I'm saying? But when you get these Christians, oh, come on, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, it's not a big deal. It's very, very serious. Verse 32, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. The guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Chastened of the Lord. What was the chastening? Satan was allowed to destroy his flesh. Mm-hmm. I'm convinced um, that you can live a pretty good life as a Christian. Okay? Yes, you will suffer. That's always going to be there. You're going to have those aspects. But I've seen God's blessing. I've seen it in a great way. But it comes because you're judging your sins. You see? And you're doing things for the Lord. The Lord will bless you greatly when you're doing that. And again, you know, I didn't really cover this a whole lot, but if you look at verse 30, for this calls many are weak and sickly among you, save people, and many sleep. When you get a Christian that does not discern the Lord's body, discern what he went through and the kind of pain and suffering that our Lord had to pay on that cross, and you just go, eh, you know, okay, yeah, whatever, you know, we all have our opinions, you know, okay, I'm doing whatever. Whatever, you know, I don't have a conviction. My conscience doesn't bother me. When you do that, if you keep doing that sin, because remember, again, all sin is negative. So you get the Christian that smokes cigarettes and stuff and has a hard time with that. They get to the point where they're saying, ah, well, you know, my conscience doesn't convict me. Well, guess what? You're going to get lung cancer. You're going to get emphysema. You're going to have other problems. The Christian that drinks alcohol, you know, that gets drunk occasionally or something like that. They still have some remnants of that old whatever. It's going to give you, you know, cirrhosis of the liver or some other disease. The Christian that overeats, especially the junk food now, you know, I mean, the junk food's filled with poison. It's almost as poisonous, you know, poisonous as cigarettes or alcohol or anything, you know. And a lot of the alcohol is synthetic, too. And not to mention the cigarettes and the issues there. But you see, all sin is negative. So when the Lord says, okay, Think about what I had to pay on the cross to pay for your sins, the purchase price of your salvation, the blood that he shed on the cross. There should be conviction there. When you know that you're doing something wrong, you say, hey, he paid for this thing. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you have a child that's, that's unruly and they go and they break something. You go, what are you doing? Hey, you know, I had to work hard for that. I paid for that. Why just break it? That doesn't make any sense. That's what God the Father thinks of a Christian that just goes haphazardly and just breaks things and does things, breaks his laws, you know. It doesn't seem to care. God might have to uh, punish you for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here's another thing that the devil will get you with. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. 
What is your motivation for ministry, for serving the Lord? It better be charity, because if it's not charity, you're wasting your time. And I'll tell you right now, it is a major struggle for me, and I know for you out there too, if you're producing any videos of any kind, uh, the devil has hordes of people that he likes to send by to try and get you into arguments and try to get that pride welling up where you're just like, you're just wanting to smash them, you know, just, you know. And believe you me, I do suffer long with a lot of people, okay? And I don't mean that I'm suffering all the time. I'm saying I do allow them to write a lot of stupid comments and things like that. I mean, there's people, you know, some of you are like, you know, email me and you're going, Brother Brian, could you please, you know, ban so-and-so? Because, I mean, they're just like making trouble. They're just attacking you and your wife. And aren't you going to ban them? You know, I've gotten that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know. I mean, the only reason I'll ban somebody quickly is if I see profanity. You know, I put up with a lot in the comments. I put up with a lot of, in letter writing and, and ministry contacts over the years. I mean, I've been stabbed in the back. If it was literal stabbing, I'd, you know, I would have a very scarred up back. Uh, I'm glad it's not literal stabbing, but I mean, it's something else. And I always try to keep charity as the motivation for what I do. I truly want to see people's lives changed. I truly want to see people get saved. You know, I mean, there's not one group out there that I would ever turn down for salvation. If you're a sodomite, I want to see you get saved. If you're a Roman Catholic, I want to see you get saved. If you're a Muslim, I want to see you get saved. If you're whatever, go down through the list. A Satanist, a, a Jesuit, a whatever. I want to see people get saved. I do what I do out of charity. And you say 100% of the time, as much as I can. <laughs> there are times that my flesh gets the better of me and I'm just like, and then I, I do some kind of nasty thing and whatever else. That's why a lot of my videos have come down over the years. Um, because I respond in anger and things, you know, the one where I'm hitting my Bible and stuff, I was mad. I shouldn't have done that. I have apologized. I took my video down, and the hypocrites love that. They like to keep it up and say, oh, see, you know, what a liar and stuff like this. So if I make a mistake, then that's permanent, apparently, according to these people. It's funny because they profess to be Christians, and yet they can't understand the simple basic concept of when somebody says, I've sinned, and they ask God's forgiveness. God says, forgiven. Weird. And, you know, I'll take all my videos down against Stephen Anderson or any of these other fakers out there if they come out and renounce the thing that I've rebuked. I've renounced the thing of whacking my Bible that one time because I was mad. I've said I was wrong in that. I sinned in that. I shouldn't have done that. Okay? I took my video down. And these people that profess to be Christians, they're the true Christians, and I'm a false Christian. They'll keep the video up. They can't accept the fact that I've confessed it to the Lord, confessed it publicly, took my video down. God's forgiven me. But they can't. You know why? Because they're not of God. Simple. Keeping the video up just proves that. But, you know, when you get to this point of these people coming along and they're starting to really press your buttons and it's just like you're starting to get that, you know, <laughs> um, there is righteous indignation that's there. That has to be there. We have to take strong stands as Christians. We can't be politically correct. But, again, what is your motivation? Why are you rebuking a false prophet? Is it because out of charity you're thinking about the people that they're deceiving? See? I mean, read over the text again there, the verses 1 through 7. You're going to see if charity is not your motivation, it's going to profit you nothing. You're wasting your time as a Christian. That's another way that Satan can mess you up and destroy you as a Christian. I mean, you know, imagine living your whole life as a Christian. You get to heaven and the Lord just goes, eh, welcome in. You know, what about all that service? Well, that was for you. That was just your prideful things down there. No rewards. <laughs> wow. It's really something. Here's another big one. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, 8. 
says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Paul's writing this to Christians. Did you know that you can get spoiled through philosophy? Man's wisdom, the love of wisdom, however you want to define philosophy. Hmm. Romans chapter 1 comes to mind. You know, lovers of wisdom more than lovers of God. You know, the Bible talks about professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. Interesting. You know what, let me check that real quick. Did I get that? I'm trying to think here. But, you know, I'll turn back while I'm talking here. Make sure I got my scripture quotation right. Got a lot of other stuff happening right now. And did a couple other things. I'm thinking lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Not lovers of wisdom more than lovers of God. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Got my scripture references mixed up there a little bit. But my point is, brethren, philosophy, when you start to love that wisdom and you start to love the praise of men and things, um, and you start to get philosophical. That's the other thing, too, uh, where you just say, well, you know, you get away from the plain teachings of scriptures. And, and again, you know, I'm just seeing this thing. I get these people and they're writing me and they're going, you know, Brian, you're wrong. You're a heretic because you believe call upon the name of the Lord means pray. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, well, how do you know that for sure? Well, that's what the text says, first of all. Secondly, I can tell you the change that happened in my own life. Um, from false conversion for 25 years, you know, well, I can't actually technically go back to when I was first born, but until I was 25 years old, I'll say it that way, I was a false convert at eight years old in Sunday school, just to give a quick little synopsis of my testimony. When I was eight years old, I prayed the little sinner's prayer thing and no conviction, you know, or anything else. It was just, you know, you know, we were all supposed to pray it and things, make sure that you pray this and stuff. So, okay, I guess I'm supposed to pray it, uh, whatever. I repeated the little prayer, and for a long time I thought I was saved, you know. And morally, I was I was better than some, but, you know, I certainly didn't have uh, much connection to anybody in the Scriptures as far as, yeah, I can relate to them. You know, I was a false convert. It was the whole thing. And for years, I mean, even after I got saved, I thought, well, I guess, you know, I guess I was saved way back when. No, I wasn't. You know, and I remember I got, you know, to a point when I was 25 years old where my life was just in a mess, and I just cried out to God. And I stayed down on my, my, you know, knees. I was on my knees. I mean, my face was on the floor, my arms, you know, just down like this, and I was just praying and I was just weeping and crying, just saying, God, I, I'm, my life is a wreck, and I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I have no idea at this point in time. Please, God, save me. And I cried out to God, and I was down on my face like that, crying out to God for a while. I don't remember the exact amount of time, but it was a long time. Praying and just, God, I'm sorry for this, and God, I'm sorry for that. Please, God, forgive me. Please save me. And he did. You know, I'm going to be doing a sermon in the future probably on the thing of the old-time practice of Christians. They called it praying through. And um, you read old-time Christian accounts from like the 1800s and things, those people were getting down on their, on their knees, on their faces. They'd pray for hours at a time sometimes, just confessing everything that they could possibly think of before saying, God, could you please save me? And, you know, another thing I need to address here, too, is this whole no prayer thing. They're saying that people that pray a prayer are getting rid of belief in the gospel. They say, you, you know, you, the, the gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, and you're excluding that when you pray. It's like, what are you talking about? You're praying because you do believe the gospel and you're crying out to God saying, I believe Jesus died for my sins and I, I, I put my faith in you and, and please God save me. It's weird. These liars that are out there today. And I'm going to keep kicking them too. But you see, again, what is this whole philosophy thing? Man's wisdom. Man's wisdom comes in and says, well, Actually, if you look at the Greek, or if you look at um, call, has several meanings in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And you can, call could mean, and, and, and they get you all in all these little philosophical arguments. Instead of just reading plain English and says, confessing with your mouth, calling upon the name of the Lord. 
just believe what you're reading. It's not difficult, you know. But let's continue. So another way that the devil can spoil you, that he can get you destroyed, is through philosophy, traditions of men, extra biblical teachings, in other words, and rudiments of the world, which, you know, can't get into all, all that stuff right now. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. You read, there's two other accounts of uh, Demas there. Um, in the Pauline epistles and things, there's two different accounts of Demas, and he is faithful, he's with Paul, he's in the ministry, he's getting work done. And here, he's like, Demas has, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now you think, you know, the, the mental image that is kind of comes up in your mind there, you think to yourself, well, you know, you imagine Demas, you know, he's going back to the world, meaning he's like partying and he's down at the local pub or something, you know, drinking it up and arm around some scantily clad woman or something like this. I don't think that's why Demas left. Um... I think that the reason Demas left is because a lot of, for the same reason a lot of people leave the Bible-believing movement. Because it gets too, there's too much fighting. There's too much battle. There's too much suffering. And so when they love this present world, uh, what they're doing is they're going and saying, you know what, I don't want to fight anymore. And I mean, you, you got to balance this stuff out. You know, like I said earlier, you don't fight too much and forsake rest. But the point is, you can get to a point where you say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of fighting with my family. I'm sick and tired of fighting with my coworkers. I got fired from a job, you know, a year ago because of my stands for the Bible. You know what, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. You know what, I'm just going to stop making problems. We're just going to have to agree to disagree. That whole thing. I think that's what happened. I think that's why Demas forsook Paul. It wasn't that he became worldly and sinful. It's just that he was like, you know, in other words, drinking drugs, you know, whatever, illicit, you know, relations with women or something. Nah, -uh, I don't think that that was it. I think he said, I can't handle the heat of this ministry stuff anymore. I'm going to go back to the ways of the world and have my good family get togethers and get along with people and whatever else. And I'm going to tell you right now, that has been one of the most discouraging things to me in my years of ministry. This is my 10th year in ministry, and uh, we've been on the front lines. I mean, <laughs> I haven't always wanted to be here, you know, in, on the front lines of the battle. There are times I just want to do Bible studies, but every time I try to take it easy, the Lord, you know, sends somebody and they say, hey, could you do a sermon on this? I know it's controversial, but I think you could, you know, probably put something together, and it's like, <sighs> you know, <laughs> and, but here I am. Um, I'm going to stand before God someday, I keep that in mind. I think of how Jesus died on the cross, and I say, am I going to be ashamed of Him? And it's a constant challenge. You know, uh, I try, you know, there's many times that we go to go shopping or we go out in public or whatever, and I just pray, and I'm just like, Lord, please give me a chance to witness for you. Give me the courage. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, I should open my mouth, and I kept my mouth shut, and and other times I did not do a very good job witnessing and, and just, it's a struggle. It is a struggle as a Christian. I mean, you see it with the Apostle Paul. You know, pray for me, you know, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly. You know, I mean, it's just, it's one of the things you're going to struggle with as a Christian. And, you know, it's something you're going to have to do. Um, but that temptation is going to come back from time to time. Um, you know, Think about your family. Think about those good times that you once had. Think about, think about all the fun before this. Just all you ever do is fight. You're just so negative. I just can't we go back to the way it used to be between us? Are you going to be Demas? It's tempting. It's real tempting. <clears throat> Next, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It's one of these sermons that I'm kicking myself to. 
it's just like, uh, you know, the Lord has me put some of this stuff together, and it's just like I'm going through the scriptures, and he just like, you know, it's almost like he's just going, you know, you know, knock, knock, knock. Anybody home up there? Yes, sir. You know. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 10. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, that's heading our way, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Don't be a fake, you know, all, I love you when you don't really love the person. Don't do that. Verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report, you know, has your name come up yet? Your name exposed. <laughs> Give it time. You serve the Lord long enough, you'll get plenty of those. Um, <clears throat> uh, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true. You're going to be called a liar and all this other stuff. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Yeah. Um, again, you know, it's a great challenge. Uh, how are you doing with that list? You say, well, uh, you know, I, I just think I need to take a break from you know, all this stuff. I, I just, I'm getting attacked a lot, and, and I just, uh, so the approval process. Uh, do you have to be approved as a Christian? Yes. If you want to be used of God, that is. I mean, you know, you go into the military and they say, okay, basic training time, it's going to be the, uh, PT test, you know, physical training stuff, you know, and things. And okay, let's let's do some push-ups. Oh me? Uh, I'll count me out. No, I I just yeah, it's gonna make me sore. Okay, well let's do a rucksack march. You know, let's go. We're gonna we're gonna march for three miles and with big you know seventy pound pack on your back. Seventy pound? Oh no, no, I wouldn't be interested in that. Okay, well let's try going in here. Let's gonna do this uh, tear gas thing. We're gonna put this gas mask on you and stuff and we're gonna you know say well that that's gonna burn my eyes i, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um are you gonna be chosen for any kind of a battlefield position no christian if you don't go through some of this stuff here god's not going to use you and uh if god's not using you uh, there's really no no man's land Okay, the Bible talks about you either serve God or mammon. No man can serve two masters. You better get on God's side. You know, let me give you a little piece of advice here. Um, something that I've followed for a long time. Uh, this book right here, The Life of D.L. Moody by his son. This thing was written, I think, in 1899. This is an original copy of it. I found it at a used bookstore in Pennsylvania when I used to live there. And... Uh, there was a young man that came up to D.L. Moody at one point in time, and he said, Mr. Moody, he said, I just, I lack courage. I, I lack your level of conviction. And he said, what's your secret? I mean, D.L. Moody spoke to, you know, preached to just millions and millions of people. And he'd stand up in front of the crowds, and he would just preach to them. And, and they, they say that uh, over a million people got saved. I would question that number, you know, but certainly the guy did some great work. You know, because you have false converts and the whole deal, but, you know, these 1800s. But Moody's answer is something that stuck with me all these years. How do you have courage? How do, can you continue and not get messed up? And Moody's answer was this, very simple. Because I'm obsessed with my subject. Are you obsessed with your subject, Christian? Is Jesus Christ everything to you? Or is he just kind of something that you do on the weekend, Sunday, and maybe Wednesday evening prayer service? Or do you want a relationship with Jesus 24-7? Is there times that you become a uh, secret agent Christian where you're just uh, working undercover, so to speak? Or do you want to look at this list here, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, 
and much patience. Well, <laughs> I sure wish the Lord would come back. You know, sure wish the Lord would answer this prayer. He hasn't answered it yet. Um, he's approving you. He's trying to teach you patience. Afflictions. You see? Get down the list. And you have people attacking you, and you have this happening, and you have that, and you have all these different things. God's putting you through the approval process. Thank Him for it. Don't be a Demas and say, you know what, this is, this is more than I bargained for. I don't think I want this anymore. You know, I used to take stands for this King James Bible, but I got sick and tired of people calling me King James only, saying I was part of a cult. And I used to go down through the list. I used to reject Hollywood, and then people said I was crazy for that. So I said, well, maybe I should watch something. Maybe it's okay. And, and you start to back off. You know, I've been reading some of the stuff from people back in the 1800s, you know, some of the old-time preachers that I used to read about, you know, the, the way that these guys preached and what they believed and Christians, what they believed years ago. It's convicting. It's very convicting. I mean, I'm going to be sharing a little story here in a little bit about Peter Cartwright. Show you the book a while. Right there, Peter Cartwright, circuit-riding Methodist preacher back in the early 1800s. They would fight over people having ruffles on their shirts because it wasn't plain enough. If there was a dance in town, they would go and block the doors to the dance hall. They'd go shut down bars and saloons. Somebody tried to open up their business on a Sunday, they would block the doors. And, you know, and he'd say about, you know, now there are parents coming out and they have ruffled, you know, clothing when they come to church and they have this and they have that. And, and I'm reading his, and he's like, the church is really falling. And I'm going, <laughs> if you could see the Methodist church today, I mean, if only you could see it. Our standards have gotten way far away from what they are supposed to be in the Bible. Believe you me. And if you think that I'm just condemning all of you and not condemning myself, um, you know, we live a pretty clean, separated life, but I look at the standards of the people in the 1800s, something else. I'll tell you what. And the people from the 1800s, a lot of those standards and things, I mean, you know, they, of course, you can go too far with stuff, but they lived consecrated, separated lives. You know, you didn't just come along and say, hey, I'm saved now. I prayed some prayer back then. That didn't work. There had to be a big change in your life. So, we've talked about the guilty stuff now. And I'm sure that the Holy Spirit has been poking and prodding and saying, that's what you're guilty of. That's what you're guilty of. You need to fix that up. You need to clean that up. He's trying to help you. When I read this stuff and you get under conviction, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through me, through His Word that you have there in front of you, to convict you, to help you clean your life up. But now what can you do to get back in fellowship with the Lord and send Satan running away? Well, let me show you the thing about Satan here first. Go to the book of James. There are things, uh, you know, in the Bible that are given for instruction in righteousness that are going to be true in any dispensation. So let's read here. James chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? It's hard. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's not hopeless. Sometimes it feels hopeless. Sometimes it just feels like this whole world is just caving in around you, you know, and you think to yourself, I mean, it just, it can't get any worse than this, you know. And it does. And, you know, you get frustrated and you have, you know, anxiety attacks and you're just like, I cannot believe this. I can't believe this is going on right now. God, please help me. Things. The way that you get through that stuff is to resist the devil. Fight him. Talk about some solutions here. Ways to do that as we continue. 
Um, continue, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Oh boy, get a hold of that one. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. You know, when humility starts, when you're broken as a sinner, like I did my little our little skit where I said I'm not lost, you know, and things. Um, when you finally realize, I am lost, aren't I? And you and you look and you say, you know, I prayed some prayer, or I I thought I believed in that Jesus died for my sins and everything else, but my my life, there's just nothing there. There's just no no proof to me that I'm even saved. I don't know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And all of a sudden you get that fear in your heart and you go, what if I'm not saved? And your friends are like, oh, you're saved. You're, you, you go to church. You're a faithful member. You, you've believed in Jesus. You've, you, you talk about the gospel. Blah, 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 and you go, but I don't know. I'm not sure. And for the first time you get that fear there and you say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hmm. And you get down on your knees and you say, God, I don't know for sure where I'm going to go when I die. See what's going on? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. Down on the floor or in the dirt or wherever you're at. Get down and you start praying to the Lord. You call upon the name of the Lord and you say, I know Jesus died for me and I don't... Lord God, please, I... I need to be saved. I believe he died for me, Lord, but but I don't know for sure. I need to know. I need to know that you saved me. Praying through is what the old timers called that. And they'd confess every single thing that they could think of. See, they had fear. They had conviction. They weren't like the people that just eat and drink unworthily, not discerning the Lord's body. And just go, oh, yes, you know, okay, go, oh, it's, oh, I like this grape juice. This is good. Is this Welsh's grape juice? You know, this is nice and stuff. I used to do that growing up in the church building that I'd go to. They'd have these little crackers and stuff, and then they'd have the little grape juice thing and stuff. And I remember other teenagers and stuff, they'd be sitting there, and they'd, you know, you're not supposed to drink the cup until the pastor says, this do in remembrance of me. And everybody go, like this. And there'd be teenagers, and they'd be sitting there, and they'd put their head down, and they'd go, you know, they'd lick at it and stuff, and, you know, and, and stuff and they what are they doing they're not discerning the lord's body and i'll tell you right now most of the people in that building weren't either adults and children you don't think about what jesus went through but you know what it'll do you some good sometimes there cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double-minded be afflicted and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness there's nothing wrong with that. Nowadays they say you got to take a pill, you got a depression problem. No, 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 no. Depression is a normal thing for you to go through. It's a time of self-examination. Why are you depressed? I don't know for sure I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Okay, then get it fixed up. Humble yourself in, before the Lord. Get down on your knees and say, God, I need help. Cry out to God. You see, don't just be in your pride and say, I don't need to pray. I took salvation. I don't need it. I don't need to I don't need to call and ask and stuff like that. I'll just take it. It's mine. You know? It's just insanity. I, I'm, some of these people I just I, I don't you know, you know I'll say this, tell you another little story. Uh, my wife and I we were uh, talking about this the other day. I was telling her this story and my son was there too and he doesn't quite get all this stuff yet. I mean he's two and a half years old, but I was telling a story. Um, my dad, growing up, was a paramedic. Uh, I think it was 25 years. And uh, I remember this one time, uh, he had a monitor at home, this little thing, and he could hear emergency calls and stuff like this because he was, you know, on call and things a lot of times. And uh, <clears throat> he, sometimes he would go, if it was in local area, he would get in a car and get his medical supplies and go to the scene of the accident. Well. There was a, somebody called 911. There's a car, it's rolled over and stuff, and, and it was 
a couple miles from, you know, our house that I grew up in. And uh, my dad, <clears throat> he gets in the car and goes there. And this guy had gone through the windshield, you know, smashed right through the windshield with his head. And he's laying in the field and his car's rolled over, over that way. And just, just, you know, face just sliced to pieces. And he's just blood all over the place, glass in the and the wounds and everything else, broken glass. I mean, just really bad shape, totally unconscious, totally knocked out. And so my dad had a light and he's, you know, he's got the guy and he's, he's taking the glass out and he's putting the bandages on. I mean, the guy's bleeding to death. So my dad got there and he's, he's fixing the guy up and this drunkard, he was drunk. My dad said you could smell alcohol on him. And, um, <clears throat> he comes too, wakes up and he's what the blah, 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 you know, he starts profanity and stuff. And he starts to rip these bandages off of his face. And my dad, you know, is grabbing the guy's arms and saying, stop, you're bleeding. You have to stop this. I'm trying to help you. And, you know, the ambulance came and they, they helped the guy and he survived and everything. But my dad used to always joke and he would say, the one piece of equipment that all ambulances need to handle drunks is a lead pipe, <laughs> you know, because they'll do all kinds of weird things. You know, and, and I thought about it and I thought, you know, a lot of these people, it's like, that's what they're doing. Christians come along and we're saying, you know, the gospel says, I mean, just call upon the name of the Lord. And they're going, don't tell me about that stuff. I can, I can do it myself. It's, it's about me. It's about uh, my belief. I don't need to pray. I don't need to call upon the name of the Lord. I'll just rip this stuff off. And we're going, no, but, but let me explain to you. And, you know, and as a Christian, you're going to get that. You're going to find people that you're trying sincerely out of charity to help them. And you're going, let me show you what the scriptures say. And you're putting work into that person. And they just go, and they rip the bandages off and they throw them down. And they say, I don't need your help. Not realizing they're bleeding to death. They're on their way to hell. Frustrating, you know, very frustrating. But as a Christian, you have to go through this thing of self-examination. And when you humble yourself and you're thinking about how Jesus died on the cross and you're, you're examining yourself and judging your sins and things like that, um, you're going to find when you do that that the devil's not going to mess with you as much. Okay? I'm going to show you about this. <clears> 1 <throat> Peter chapter 5. 